<laughs> Here's my learning outcomes. I have three. Understand the concepts and the importance of hope. That, that's where we're going to go to first. We're going to just do some of that knowledge portion. But as we go through this, I really want you to appreciate the value of developing hope or in the case, sustaining hope. And then all of us, we, we want to grow spiritually. We want to develop within ourselves and we want to help others to develop a closer relationship with our Lord. And by the way, I, I know as I'm looking at this audience that, that you guys are well grounded in your faith have been growing in your faith. Some of you are in, incredibly strong in your faith, but we know some who are not, and we know some who are struggling with hope, and perhaps in, in their life have found themselves in a situation where there is no hope of some kind. And I'm not just talking about physical hope as in uh, an illness or something like that. I'm talking about also sometimes relationships that people have, um, situations in their life, maybe even something like work or whatever, where they just say, there's just no hope. How, what am I going to do? And, and so this, we know people like that. And, and if, if somebody's listening to this out on the internet and, and you're struggling with hope or you have someone struggling with hope, then I appreciate that you're listening, tuning in, and I encourage you to continue. Now, I'm not always going to be presenting information strictly from a biblical perspective. It is biblically based, not just because this is a Bible class, but we're going to find out that that's the basis of true hope. But we're going to try to inject some practical things, too. How do I restore hope if I've lost it? How do I discover hope? How, what are the stages that I go through from uh, a situation where I may not have hope to where I'm full of hope? And it's so some practical things as well as the spiritual things. All right, let's get started. There's a lot of uh, words. All right, let me look at this, make sure I'm doing the right thing here. The green button. There we go. Words have meanings, don't they? Different meanings to different people. Well, the word hope means different things to different people, depending on a variety of situations. But the basic definition is a desire accompanied by expectation, expectation of or belief in fulfillment. That's the Merriam-Webster dictionary, online dictionary specifically. But there's some key words in here or a key point to this. Uh, in, in this general definition of hope, uh, I, I like the expression expectation fulfilled. And we're going to talk about Hebrews 11 <laughs> uh, just briefly. Expectation fulfilled. We, we all have desires and, and expectations, but the degree to which they are or will be filled is key to our hope, the level of hope that we have. Hope's one of the most powerful concepts in life, and it's at the heart of Scripture. Everything about Scripture, our Lord coming here, our Lord dying for us, and, and, and the forgiveness and the salvation we have all point to hope. We have a hope of eternal life with the Father. And, and so uh, hope is foundational to life. It's foundational to eternal life our relationship with the Lord, based on our relationship with the Lord. It's at the heart of the Bible. We're in the hope business. You ever think about that? Now, that's one of the most important things that we do is helping people discover true hope. That's what we do as disciples of our Lord. We offer to the world hope through Jesus Christ. We're not offering it. Our Lord's offering it, but we're the vehicle through which it's transmitted we're the ones who teach the gospel. I live a good life. I'm a, I'm a good man. I, I, I do what I'm supposed to do, like, kind of like the rich young ruler, you know. I've done all those things. What now do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and I, our Lord puts it on us. So I live a good life. I do what I'm supposed to do. Sooner or later, you got to open your mouth and share the gospel. 
living a good life is not sharing the gospel. It's living it, and the example is important, but there's a seeker out there that the Lord's going to bring your way. Be ready. Grab the moment and the opportunity and experience the joy of seeing hope rise in somebody. And it kind of validates and strengthens your hope. So we're in the hope business. So this is an important concept for all of us to learn. We need to learn it. need to experience it. need to share it with others. So hope helps provide motivation to begin or to continue in our challenging moments in life. I'm going to touch on that in just a minute. Uh, the, 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 the idea of hope is that it blends within ourselves our experiences from the past, our view of the future, and what's going on right now in our life. And if right now in my life, because of what's happened in my past and what's going on in my life, I feel like I have no hope, what do you think is going to be my view of the future? Hopeless. We're going to touch on that in a minute. I, in, in researching this and writing about it, somebody had said, and I don't remember the exact location, but somebody said, a hopeless person, it's almost impossible to care. Think about that. If I'm hopeless, if I have no view of the future, why do I care? And we know what happens. In my early years as an instructor in the Air Force, I went through training about how to deal with somebody uh, experiencing uh, thoughts of suicide. And we, we talked about in one of the sessions about hapless, hopeless, and helpless. That was the expression the instructor used. That, that really stuck to me. And, and so somebody who is hapless and hopeless, they don't care. And so it, it won't automatically but it can lead to somebody hurting themselves or or actually attempting suicide and again hope is so important just incredibly important without it we just really don't have anything and our lord gives it to us that's what's so wonderful about it well the view of our life experiences our expectations and our current life you know it can be positive or negative depending on what's going on. But one of the things we need to realize is this is not the end of the story. This is only the beginning of it and, and the pathway toward an even greater story. And that, of course, is life eternal with our Lord. That's why it's important that we offer people hope through Jesus Christ. All right, there are some uh, additional words that go along with hope. Hopeless and hopeful. Let's talk about hopeless. Hopeless, you know, two words, means there's little to no expectation of something good or some kind of success. Hopeless. I'm without hope. I have no expectation. Uh, someone once said, as I've just said, that it makes it impossible to care, and, and I understand that. Now, on the more positive side, dare I say hopeful side, is the word hopeful. The word is made of two words, hope and full. The word full communicates a measure of quality. So you take hope, meaning I have this expectation or belief in fulfillment, and you add full to it, then I have a higher degree of hope. But it's interesting, the word hopeful does not necessarily mean full of hope. But if you're hopeful, you do have a level of expectation that something you want to happen will happen. I'm hopeful it'll happen, whatever it is. Um, there's more hopeful or some that are have a greater expectation. Okay, depending on the situation. But there still remains a sense of doubt. I'm, I'm hopeful that such and such will happen. So hopeless and hopeful, those are, those are two words. Now, I want to transition here. Uh, we, we've got a kind of a basic understanding, and I, I know that the word hope is something that we understand quite a bit about, 
But I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about uh, two different views of hope, and, and you understand these as well, but it's good again to be, <laughs> there we go, <laughs> to be reminded of these. All right, two views of hope. Uh, the world's view and uh, our, our view as Christians, what we should grow to. Now, again, you know somebody who might need this. If you feel you understand it very well, praise God. Wonderful. But sh share it with others. All right, the world's view or an earthly view. Now, first of all, there's nothing inherently wrong with this. But if it's all you have, then that's short. Uh, that, that's, you're not there yet. It's pretty good, but it can get so much infinitely better. The view is the worldly view. It's one in which we all share. Uh, this view sees hope as kind of a vague desire for something. Uh, I've kind of touched on that. Almost wishful thinking. It might be in a positive way, I hope such and such happens, or it might be a negative thing. I hope such and such doesn't happen. So you see, it's, it's just some way of, of thinking about something not inherently wrong. It's a feeling of, well, maybe so, or I think so. Uh, I would like for it to be. Uh, the view expresses a level of doubt, though. And here's something else about it, too. It can be risky. It can be easily lost. Because we're looking at it a lot of times from our current situation. And if something in that situation radically changes, so too does our perception of hope about that situation. Um, I, again, you know, toward, I don't want to go to a sports analogy. Uh, yeah, but, you know, beyond the, the sports analogy of it, somebody who has received a terminal diagnosis or someone who has their marriage gone, They're, I mean, it's final, and there's that feeling, I've lost hope. One day I was standing tall. In my cancer situation, I had no idea it was coming my way. We were driving back from Texas, having been out there on some sojourner activity, and I get home and boom, it hit that fast. I mean, within minutes, I went from normal to exhibiting some scary symptoms. My hope was not destroyed at all. But some people, if that's all they've got, I, I mean, we got to get them to understand there's so much more than that. And we can. We can do it. But we do look at our current life situation and we gauge our level of hope a lot of times by what's going on in my life. Hey, I got a good job. Uh, things are stable, the things I really need in my life are there, my relationships are stable, life is great. But then life happens, and hope can be challenged. And so the view of hope from a worldly view is fragile. It's generally short-term, and it's associated with immediate gratification. Things are good for me right now. Or I have a hope that, you know, 10 years from now or something like that, things will be pretty good. But it's, it's focused very terminal, this life. Again, nothing inherently wrong with that, but that's all somebody has, then, then they're missing something. Uh, the, the, these generally point to this life, not to eternity. And in fact, sometimes people, because they're in that situation where things are going great in life right now, they're blind to the fact of what's coming down the track at them. Satan would love us to be in that situation. That's called complacency. Everything's great. I don't have to worry about anything. And Satan loves that. All right, let's shift where we want people to go to, where we want us to go to. And again, 
We share both of these as children of our Lord. (laughs) Our Lord came to give us life and to give it to the full. That's this physical life as well. Because we know when we're challenged, we don't lose our joy. We may be saddened, we may be fearful, but we don't lose it. It's still there. So we share both of these. And that's what we want to give others. A mature Christian, and, and, and I, want to, I want to change that. I'm sorry. Not a mature Christian, a maturing Christian. Next week, we're going to talk about journey to hope and stages we go through. And we're going to talk about when it starts and what we grow to. So as we mature as Christians, so too does the strength of our hope. Brent and I were talking just a couple of minutes last night. Somebody that's new in the faith may be feeling challenged because they haven't felt that strength, that joy, that hope that we talk about. And, and that in itself is a challenge to them. But they grow to that. And I'm going to say it again next week, but I want to say it again right now. If you're in the kingdom, praise God, you are in the kingdom with all of the benefits of the relationship with our Lord. The moment you have submitted to our Lord and followed through with the baptism, you're in the kingdom. Praise God for that. Don't ever lose sight of that. All right, so a mature Christian sees hope as I know so. I'm sure of. Did you feel that when you first obeyed the gospel? I didn't. It was, well, I I did what the preacher said to do, and I I feel like it was the right thing to do, but I had no idea the journey I had ahead of me, and that's okay. I was in the kingdom, and I learned of the hope as I grew. And so we grow into this. We mature into the idea of I know so, and I'm sure of. Uh, this view is based on our knowledge of God's faithfulness, and that, that's the beauty of it. God wants us to understand his faithfulness. Scripture is, boy, if it doesn't teach anything, it teaches God's faithfulness to us, to his servants. But a Christian says, I, 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 I know so. Uh, I'm sure of. Yes, it's there but we grow into that. We don't necessarily have it at first. Or we may have it and not fully understand it, but we grow in it. And when we grow in it, so does our faith. And our Lord is faithful. Excuse me, faithful to us. Uh, Scripture points to the evidence so many times. And that is why I say we offer it to the world. As Christians, uh, as we grow spiritually, we develop greater confidence in what God promises. And I want to say something real quick. One of the other things we experience as we grow in our hope and our knowledge about what the Lord's done for us, we grow in humility too. I, it, when, when I say I'm saved, I, I know I'm saved. I don't mean that in any kind of a, hi, I got mine, I'm in the lifeboat. Oh, no, no, no. That's something, phew. It will drive you to your knees. That's thanking the Lord for that. It really is not a a haughty thing or a conceited thing. It's a humble thing. But it's also something that builds confidence. That's what 1 John chapter 1 teaches us if we're walking in the light. And, And we come back to our Lord. We're forgiven. How great that verse or that chapter is. So we grow spiritually. We develop a greater confidence in what God promises. Uh, Okay, 2 Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, he's approaching the end of his life, and I love this verse. It's one of the most hope-filled passages in Scripture. And, and of course, Paul's a super saint. I mean, he's up there. He he had a one-on-one experience with the Lord on more than one occasion, but one particularly that that brought him to an understanding. And, And what Uh, we're going to do when Mark takes over the class is he's going to show some examples of some not so super saints who went 
shift from hopeful, or hopeless rather, to hopeful. But the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, and I love this because he transfers his hope to us, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Isn't that a great statement? Paul's saying, I fought a good fight. I, I'm, I, I have the hope. I know so. And then he says, but not just me. You guys as well. I just love the way he does that. He, he, he's not pointing to himself. He's being evangelistic with it. Isn't that great? It was just that one sentence. So he says, I have hope, but so do you. Don't forget that. And so that's a wonderful statement that he makes there. And, and so in Scripture, uh, we, we find God's promise of salvation through grace. We find faith, or his salvation through grace and faith, Ephesians 2 and 8. Uh, we learn about true love. Uh, and, and because of that, and, and so many other promises and examples, we also find hope. And so scriptures are there for us, and, and we share that with people. And maybe that's a good place to start when you're teaching somebody the gospel. You can take them to some of the hope-filled statements and work backwards from there. You could take them there to 2 Timothy and say, why do you think Paul would be able to say that to Timothy? To Timothy? <laughs> why would he be able to say that? It, well, what, what gave him that confidence? And, and how can others have that as well? And then you can start teaching them about our Lord and what he offers. And that's what we need to do. We need to teach them the Lord. Because that's where our hope is, our eternal hope, our, our true hope. So hope is the thread that runs throughout scriptures. Uh, it, it, you know, we talk about 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, and love. Hope is there. It's part of it. But it's ever present. And, and uh, you know, you see it in varying degrees, but it's ever present throughout scripture. And so the view of hope should ignite a desire to continue to know the future and that it's sustained by our relationship with our Lord. I want to turn to Hebrews 11. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. I mean, you start out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hebrews 11 is all about faith. Absolutely. I mean, it starts out with that. But notice a key word in Hebrews 11, verse 1. You find the word hope. But look how it's couched, how it's communicated. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Remember I said to a Christian, it's, I know so. So our faith that builds our hope is an assurance. First century Christians didn't die or be willing to die on a well, maybe so. Huh? I, I think I'm saved. Well, when I came up out of the water, Brent said I was okay. Oh, no. Go down. Oh, I love it. And <laughs> Go down to um, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 32. Hebrews 11 is incredibly crafted. It starts out with some specific examples of people who had a one-on-one -on -one with God. And then it goes down to somebody who m had a relationship with God, not face-to-face. -face. And then it goes down to a second hand. And then it goes down to like you and I, where we read it and learn about it through others. But you start reading in verse 32 and you go down through there. And I want to pick up in verse 36. 
five. Well, no, let me read 32. Verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put for, foreign armies to flight. Oh, man, yeah, heroes. Wow. Super people. Then he shifts. The writer says, women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refused to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. I don't want a part of that. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. I don't want any of that. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Love that statement. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And then how does it end? And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So they endured all of that, did not lose their faith, did not lose their hope, because their hope was not on this world. In, in the narrative of the, the book I'm writing, I talk about if you are in a hopeless situation that you may not really be hopeless, but you feel it's hopeless. You need to shift your view. Stop looking at this situation, even if it truly is hopeless, and go beyond that and say, okay, I can accept that. Life's going to end anyway. So I've got to look for something beyond that. And that's what we find through our Lord. And that's true hope. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself for my notes, but I'm going to jump into that later on into a little bit more detail. So I love that in Hebrews 11, how, how they were challenged with some things I don't want a part of at all. Nobody should. And that they remain faithful because of their assurance of things hoped for. Let me wrap up. Hope is a critical element of life. If you don't have hope in your life, you're among the most sad of the world, and there's no need for it. But hope is critical in life, both the current and into eternity. The world sees hope, I think so, or maybe so, I'd like for it to be, but a Christian sees hope as I know so, I'm sure of. John wrote a, in, in his uh, writing in First John, I, I say these things so that you will know. Not guess at, so you'll know. And so the difference is based on our understanding of God uh, as faithful to his promises. And so in a world so full of uncertainty, hope given by our Lord just shines as a beacon in the night and, and how it lifts the darkness and, and tears away the terror of the moment. And so the world offers counterfeit hope. Looks like hope, but is not. And when it's challenged, it falls apart. Our Lord offers true and everlasting hope. And so we're the vehicle to present that to the world. That's, that's our life. That's our mission. I don't care who you are. As a child of God, that's what you do, is you teach about our Lord Jesus Christ and the hope offered through him. All right, so again, in our next lesson, we're going to take a look at the stages of our journey to hope, from being a seeker to a full understanding and grasping of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much.